Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for this technical hitch. This is our first beginning and this is expected, but I think that subsequent lectures will be much uh, better organized. Uh, this morning, I'll be talking about giving an introduction to Claire Pivan Pallet. It's going to be a general discussion. I hope the lockdown is not affecting us too much and I wish us to have a very wonderful time together. My presentation, the outline of my presentation, I will give a brief introduction. I'll give a global body of Clef of uh, from Palate, talk about the epidemiology, the etiology and genetics, highlight the embryology and do the classification, and focus on the critical elements of care, and then conclude. Professor Kurt Cotting, The professor of plastic surgery from New York University, in his review of the book Management of Clever and Palate in the Developing World, written by Mars M. Seldi and Hava Root, and I quote, the chapter I would like to see in this book, but is not present, will be written by members of a local CLEF team from a developing country that has gone all the way to sufficiency in CLEF care, including speech and orthodontics as well as surgery, and who train fellows as part of their efforts. I would like to know from their point of view how we in developing country can best help them. End of quote. The global body of bad effects, we know that more than 4 million children are born yearly with bad effects. And craniofacial anomalies comprise a large fraction of these bad effects and it's just less frequent than congenital heart disorders and claw feet. Cleft clip and with or without palate is the most common craniofacial bad effect, with an estimated quarter of a million affected babies that are born each year. In Africa, we don't have detailed assessment of the numbers that we have, but we know that apart from these newborn babies, we also have a backlog of untreated cleft and palate in our own regions. And it is a costly public health problem with an average life treatment cost per child in the United States estimated to be roughly 101,000 US dollars. We know that bad defense are imagined as a cause of neonatal mortality in countries that have, made, that have made progress in control of infectious disease and malnutrition. However, we know that in our own clan, infectious disease and malnutrition is still a great burden to us. So adding this neonatal, but, uh, this bad defense is an addition to what we have in our own environment. There are strategies that have been proposed to reduce this global body impact. The first one is effective family planning. Evidence have shown that if families are planned properly, especially using genetic counseling and prenatal diagnosis, we can greatly reduce. Because with ultrasonic uh, technology, a lot of babies that are born with clear can pick up in utero and something can be done about that. The second strategy is education of couples to decrease maternal exposure, to avoid environmental and genetic risks, such as tobacco, alcohol, and teratogenic medications. We're going to talk later about the etiology, but we know that the etiology is both gene and environmental interactions. The third strategy is to improve preconception, maternal intake of micronutrients such as folic acid, 400 micrograms. And the fourth is improving the availability of medical and surgical care locally so that the affected children can be treated. And I think this is one of the efforts that we're making so that our care can be improved. What is the epidemiology of cleft and palate? Cleft lip with or without palate has an average birth prevalence of one in to 700. It ranges from one to 500 to one to 2000, depending on the race. We know that cleft and palate alone constitutes 46% of this burden 33% of cleft and palate are cleft palate alone. 
and 21% are just cleft lip, and 2% is bifid jugular. There are wide ethnic variations because of the etiology of this, both the gene and environmental interactions. The least is in the blacks that have a prevalence of 1 in 2,000 live bags. Next is the Caucasians, which is the white that has 1 in 1,000 live bags. And the highest incidence is in Asians with 1 in 500 live bags. But we know that isolated clear palate has no racial variation and it has a prevalence of 0.5 in 1,000 live bags. The gender distribution will know that isolated clear palates alone is more common in females than males, with a ratio of male to female one to two. But when it comes to clear and clear, clear palates, the males are more affected than the females with a ratio of two to one. But when it comes to the uh, vela clefts, it has equal distribution one to one. When we talk about the laterality of clefts, we know that more clefts occur on the left side than the right side. And when you look at the left, right, and bilateral ratio, we see that there are six times in the left side to three times in the right side and one bilateral. So have a ratio of six to three to one in the laterality, left, right, and bilateral. And this is a global evidence that is represented all over the world, not only in Caucasians, but generally, this is what you have. Clefts are referred to as syndromic or non-syndromic based on the association with other anomalies. So most of the clefts that we see, majority are non-syndromic or have syndromic. However, about 50% of cleft palate alone are syndromic, are associated with syndrome. And 10% of cleft and palate are once associated with syndrome. So when we see a baby with a cleft palate, we need to do more investigation because about half of them are associated with a syndrome. But cleft and palate are only 10% associated with the syndrome. And what are these common syndromes that are associated with cleft and palate? They are the Van der Boe, the Treasure Collins syndrome, Down syndrome, orofacial digital syndrome, optic syndrome, craniofacial microsomia, and fetal alcohol syndrome. There are so many syndromes, but these are the commonest ones that are associated with cleft and palate. In the syndrome cleft, nearly half of the syndrome cleft palate presentation associated with a triad of micrognatia, glossopopsis, and airway obstruction, which is known as the Perrobin sequence. And the most common sy syndromic presentation of this triad, sorry. The most common are found in the 25% and develop cardiofacial syndrome and 15%. Sorry, I, yes. Yeah, 25% are in the stick class syndrome, which accounts for that and cardiofacial syndrome accounts for 15% of syndromic clear palate individuals. Nearly half of the syndromic clear palate presentations are just, sorry. I'm having issues with my. Non syndromic cleft lip and palate is a complex trait. Oh, now we are talking about the etiology. The etiology is complex. There is no definitive cause that can say, okay, this is the only cause. But we know that it's multifactorial with what we call the gene gene interactions and the gene environment interactions. And we know that identification of key genes contributing to genesis of radial clefts will help in early diagnosis, disease prevention, and possibly developing adjunctive therapies. So a lot of science is going into the genetic uh, uh, cause of cleft and palate. I'm happy that Professor Adiema will be talking more about this genetics. So we're going to know more about that when he makes his presentation. But the most recent estimates suggest that anywhere from 3 to 14 genes 
contribute to clear paper and pilot. Candidate genes and local response for non syndrome clear paper and pilot have been identified on chromosomes 1, 2, 4, 6, 11, 14, 17, and 19, 22 to 24. Two genes, the interferon regulatory factor 6 and the muscle sequence homobox, MX1, now seem to explain about 15% of isolated Cleveland palate. Mutations in this interferon regulatory factor 6 lead to Van der Voo and Popliteal Terrigium syndrome. Mutations in other genes, the T-box transcription factor 22, the fibroblast group factor and reception 1, and the tumor protein 63 also contribute to syndromic clefts. Aberrant transformation growth factor beta 3, TGF beta 3, signaling plays a role in the pathogenesis of cleft palate. So when we talk about the genes, as I've said, Professor Idemo is going to give us a better detail in understanding of this because of the possibility of controlling, having better therapies and management of cleft lip. But when it comes to environmental factors, there are lots of environmental factors that have been implicated in the etiology of cleft lip and palate. The first, we know that cigarette smoking in the first trimester of pregnancy has been implicated in a lot of bad defects, and cleft is one of them. So mothers who smoke have a higher tendency of having cleft babies. Folic acid deficiency during the preconceptual period has also been investigated and found to have an association, not only with the neural crest uh, tube, but also with cleft lip. So in most centers now, the prescription of folic acid to pregnant mothers is one of the uh, preventive therapies that are being given. Maternal exposure to alcohol. We know that alcohol also has been implicated as an environmental factor in the cause of cleft and palate. Teratogenic medications such as retinoids, corticosteroids, and anticonvulsants, phenytoin, and valporic acid have also been implicated. In cultures that will have consanguineous marriages, we see a lot of these cleft babies. In our own environment here, we see that the Fulanis that are married, that are inter married in their family that have these consanguineous marriages. We see that that is for our own antecedent uh, finding here, that we see that a lot of them have cleft lip and, uh, cleft lip and palate. Maternal diabetes has also been implicated as an environmental factor. Obesity has also been linked to an increase of orofacial clefts. However, less consistent associations have been found between clefts and maternal viral infection, such as rubella and varicella. So these are the environmental factors that have been implicated as etiology factors in cleft lip and palate. When a mother or a family has a cleft, their concern is what is the possibility of the other children to have cleft lip and palate. And the familiar risk for cleft lip and palate is one, if the parents are not affected and they have a child, one child that has cleft lip and palate, the risk for the next child to have cleft and palate is 4%. When the parents are not affected and two of their children are affected with cleft and palate, the risk increased to 9%. When the parents, one of the parents is affected, but they don't have a child that has cleft and palate, the risk reduces to 4%. But when we have an affected parent that has one child with cleft and palate, the risk for the next child increases to 17%. So when we are doing our counseling, especially for parents that have this concern, these are information they need to know. But when it comes to cleft palate, family risk of a cleft palate, if there is no affected parent and there is no family history, and it's only one child that is affected with cleft palate, the risk for the next child is 2%. When no parent is affected, but there is a positive family history, and only one child is affected with cleft palate, the risk increases to 7%. When no parent is affected and there is no family history, 
but two of the children have care palate, the risk increases to 1%. When a parent is affected, but there is no family history and no child is affected, the risk for the next child to have clear palate is 6%. And when a parent is affected and there is no family history, but one child is affected, the risk increases to 15%. So these are very valid information we need to know when we are counseling our, our, our patients, actually to address their concern about the possibility of other children having clear pip and palate. Now we come to the embryology. Clear pip and clear palate is embryologically, anatomically, genetically different from isolated clear palate. So these are two different conditions. The embryologic development of the face begins at four weeks after conception and it starts from the neural crest ectomesenchyme that forms five prominences. These prominences are the frontonasal process and the paired maxillary process, processes and mandibular processes surrounding a central depression. During the fifth and sixth weeks of, of embryonic development, bilateral maxillary processes derived from the first breaker arch they fuse with the media nasal process to form the upper lip, alveolus, and the primary palate. The lateral nasal process forms the alar structures of the nose, and the mandibular processes they form the lower lip of the jaw. This process of formation of the face is the consequence of a cascade of processes that involve cell proliferation cell differentiation, cell addition, and aptos aptosis, apoptosis. Failure or error in any of these cellular processes that lead to the fusion of the media nasal process with the lateral nasal and maxillary process can result in orofacial clefts. So we see that these processes in the formation that involves cell proliferation, cell differentiation, adhesion, and apoptosis. Anything that destroys this process can result in formation of clear and palate. The molecular events that underline these cellular processes are under control of a strict array of genes that include the fibroblast growth factors, FGFs, the Sony Hedgehog, SHH, the bone morphogenic proteins, and the members of the transforming growth factor beta superfamily and other transcription factors. So this failure of addition, of proliferation, of apoptosis are controlled molecularly by these genes. So once we have understanding, and that's why the genetic understanding of clefit is very important. So we see what is happening that is responsible for this in the embryology stage. The formation of the secondary palate begins during the sixth week after conception from the two palatal shells, which extend from the internal aspect of the maxillary processes. During the eighth week, these bilateral maxillary palatal shells, after ascending to an appropriate position above the tongue, fuse with each other and the, the primary palate. So we see that the secondary palate from as two initially they are vertical, the tongue we see the picture later, and then once they meet in the midline and fuse with themselves and also with the primary palate to form the secondary palate. A disruption and diffusion of these embryonic components can occur due to delay in elevation of the palatal shears from the vertical to horizontal. So, what causes this cleft palate? You can see that they are also multifactorial. If there is a delay in the elevation of the palatal shells, as I told you that, from the vertical to the horizontal, maybe due to the lack of descent of the tongue, it can result in non-fusion. We can have defective shell fusion, or post-fusion they might fuse, and later post-fusion rupture resulting in a cleft of the secondary palate. And also now fusion takes longer in females, and that is why we have more females with cleft palate than males. 
And also, the left side is more common due to slower shelf elevation. So the shelf elevation on the right side is higher, is faster than the left one. And that is what is responsible for the left side cleft more than the right side cleft. So we can see this is, you can see this is the lateral nasal plaque, and this is the media, and this is the maxillary process. You can see the trans. So as they move together to now form the face, you can see the yellow side is from the maxillary process. The, uh, the blue one is from the lateral nasal, and the mid, uh, pink one is, is from the, uh, what's it called now, from the media process. So this is how the face is formed from the processes of, and the mandible is formed from the medullary process. You can see the lower lip. When it comes to the palate, you can see the shelf. This is the nasal chamber. This is the palatal shelf. You can see the palatal shelf. And this is the tongue. You can see it properly here. And then it moves to this position. When the tongue descends, you see the tongue has descended, and this one starts moving to each other, to the midline. And when they fuse, they now fuse to form the secondary palate, and this is what you see. So anything that disrupts this elevation, that disrupts this addition, that even after it had, had, had hires and it then breaks down, these are causes of the secondary clear palate. Now we've come and talk about the classification. Classification is necessary in order to standardize documentation and communicate effectively the types of class classification system have been described. Various types of class classification have been described. These classifications are so varied. Starting from 1922 by Davis and Ritchie, we see that it translates and goes, and there are so many variations and modifications and things like that. So we see that there are different, there's a lot of classifications that have been described. The Canahan and Stars classification and diagram is one, that's the Y strip, is one of the most used around the world. However, new approaches have also used mathematical expressions to provide a complete description of the deformity, including those which can be used for computerized data analysis. So classification, we know that this classification is an ongoing thing. So, but now we use the one that is most convenient for us and use that the one that fits suits our own environment. We know that a complete cleft lip is a cleft of the entire lip and the underlying premaxilla and alveolar arch. An incomplete cleft palate involves only the lip. The primary palate is the anterior to the incisive foramen and involves the nose, the lip, and the alveolar process, which are structures that develop from the frontonasal process. The secondary palate, as we've been saying, are posterior to the incisive foramen and involves both the hard and soft palate, the uvula and the pharynx. We have the submucous cleft, which can be the bifid uvula, the v notch in the soft palate. I'm now going to show you some illustrations, some clinical pictures of unilateral cleft lip. You see on the left side, it's an incomplete cleft lip. You can see it here. Here we can see a complete cleft lip. You can see the lip is involved, the alveolus is involved, and the floor of the nose is also involved. These are unilateral cleft lip. Here we have the bilateral cleft lip. This is an incomplete one that is also, also, also only involving the lips. The alveolus are not cleft, and the nose is intact. And here we have the incomplete one. You can see the alveolus, the floor of the nose is all affected. This is a complete bilateral cleft lip. I have this cleft of the soft palate alone. You can see it here. And this is a complete cleft of the palate. You can see both the soft and the hard palate are affected in this patient. Here we have a complete bilateral cleft lip and palate. You can see, and then the, pro, uh, the, 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 the proclined uh, premaxilla. You can see it here. I can see that the cleft is true and true. The hard palate, the soft palate, 
the alveolus, the floor of the nose, everything is cleft. I can see it. Also, have facial clefts. This is an oblique facial cleft. You can see it at the angle. And this one, you can see that it's a syndromic case. Look, sorry. You can see the tag, the air tag here. And then also we see this one. This is an oblique facial cleft. You can see it here. Now, we now come to the critical elements of cleft care. This is a very important part of this presentation. And I want us to take very good, listen attentively. The critical elements of care is produced by the Washington Department of Health, Children and Youth with Special Care Program and Seattle Children's Hospital Craniofacial Center in Seattle, Washington. This is a very important document that is useful to us that I hope that we in Africa can adopt this and use it as a guide to the type of service we provide. We know that patients with cleft and palate are best cared for by interdisciplinary team or specialists with experience in this field. I'm happy that Professor Peter Dunker will be talking about multidisciplinary care tomorrow and is going to talk more about this. But the critical care element of care is intended to assist the primary care provider in the recognition of symptoms, diagnosis, and care management related to specific diagnosis. And it provides a framework for a consistent approach to management of these children. So what is most important is for us to be able to develop a system, a framework that will provide consistent approach to management a system that will provide a consistent approach to management. And the goals of treatment for a child with clear will and palate. Most of us are surgeons and we're the first that started treating cleft. And the most obvious concern that most parents have is the aesthetic concern. And they come for especially those who have lip. And once the lip is repaired, that is within that the job is done. No, the job is not done. We have six goals in the treatment of a child with a cleft lip and palate. The first one is to repair the bad defect, which is, can be the lip, the palate, and the nose. The second one is for us to achieve normal speech, language, and hearing. So our job is not completed once the obvious things are closed. We need to treat the patient holistically. I know that what they need is not only the surgical repair, but also for them to develop normal speech, language, and hearing. Apart from these, they also need to achieve functional dental occlusion and good dental health, and also optimize the psychosocial and developmental outcomes. We're going to talk more about this because a parent that gives back to a baby is supposed to be a thing of joy. But when your baby comes out with these bad defects, especially for those who are having their first babies, is a lot of concern for these parents and also for the children that are born. So the psychosocial and development outcomes is very important. And when we do this in a comprehensive way like this, it minimizes the cost of treatment and also facilitates ethically sound, family-centered and culturally sensitive care. So these should be the goals of the treatment for a child with a clear view and palate. And I'm happy that both the West African College of Surgeons and Smile Train, that is the greatest, is the only sponsor of cleft services in, in our area, we see. And I'm happy that Smile Train has moved to this comprehensive clear care. So that we need to encourage our partners to start having teams where all the problems can be addressed. So that we don't work in silos and work in different, addressing different aspects because it's a child that we are treating and we need to treat the, try, treat the child ethically, sound, in a sound, ethically sound way, family center and culturally sensitive care. There are seven key teams for achieving these goals. The first is early assessment intervention, which is imperative and should begin in the newborn period with referral to a cleft lip and palate. 
When clearly and palate is diagnosed prenatally, referral to a teen should be offered. When mothers, we should encourage our program mothers to go for antenatal care. And we should be able to develop our skills and capabilities to be able to do ultrasound for our babies because with developing our ultrasound, a lot of these clear babies can be picked early, especially the ones with clear babies. So that once they are picked, then the adequate preparation is done. The counseling for the mothers can be done. The preparation for feeding and other things can be done. The mother will not be embarrassed or the parents will not be embarrassed when a child is born with this abnormality. The second key thing is an interdisciplinary cleft palate, lip and palate thing. Because cleft lip and palate outcomes are in surgical, speech, hearing, dental, psychosocial, and cognitive domains. So we should see that when we are working as an individual, we are not providing the appropriate care for these babies. So that we need to know that no matter the expertise we have, no single specialty can address the gamut of problems of cleft lip and palate because it's only not only surgical but also involves speech, it involves hearing, it involves dental, it involves psychosocial and cognitive domains, and these must work as an interdisciplinary cleft team. And providers with must have training and expertise because of the complexity of treatment intervention. We should not just be quacks, and that's why Smart Training and West African should be commended for this new collaborative initiative they are having to have this post fellowship training that they are doing. So that, but we should see that it's not limited to surgical aspect alone. It should be a comprehensive so that the expertise that is provided can be adequate to provide this complexity of treatment interventions. The fourth one is continuity of care. This is essential because outcomes are measured through the child's life, through the child's life, and team care is linked to improve outcomes. So it's not just a one spot treatment that baby just comes and do your surgery and that's the end of it. It is a, it is a continuum. And when we go to the interventions and the age groups, you see that it's a continuum from before birth to when the child becomes an adult. So that we need to work in this continuity of care to be able to provide this for all our patients. So that we also can be proud that we are doing the complete and comprehensive care for our patients. Proper timing of intervention is critical because of the interaction of facial groups, dental occlusion, and speech. We know that we are dealing with a complex structure, the face, the teeth, the nose, the hearing, everything, so that the proper timing of this intervention is very key, so that we don't repair a cleft palate when speech has already developed, because we know that the quality of speech that we're going to have is going to be deficient, hearing will be deficient, so that the timing for these interventions is very key. I know that our interventions also can affect the growth of the face. So we need to do the timing and do it properly. We need to coordinate. Coordination of care is necessary because of the complexity of the medical, surgical, dental, and social factors that must be considered in treatment decisions. As I've said, this is very key. When you are doing your surgeries, you need to take into cognizance the facial growth. Is the surgery you are going to do now, is it going to compromise the facial the growth of the face? Is it going to compromise the aesthetics? Is it going to, what is the effect of what you are doing? What are the other milestones for this baby to have? What are you doing to ensure that this baby has these adequate milestones at the appropriate time? And finally, we know that better early management leads to better outcomes, fear surgeries, and lower cost. So we need, especially in this uh, low income area that we are in, we need to know that. What we need to do is to see how we can get the best out of the minimum that we have. So now we're going to the summary of key intervention by age. We have these milestones that we look at. The prenatal age, back to one month, one month to four months, five months to 15 months, 16 months to 24 months, two years to five years, six years to 11 years, 12 years to 21 years. So in the prenatal period. This is when, if this thing is picked up at the antenatal, a referral to cleft lip and palate team is important. But if you don't have cleft lip and palate, where will this pediatrician or the ONG people 
who are picking this thing up, where are they going to refer to? This is also the time for medical diagnosis and genetic counseling. As I told you, the risk of other parents, other children having uh, cleft, this is the time for us to have it. We know that in our environment, we don't have geneticists, so that these are areas, uh, capacities that we need to develop. But in the prenatal period, this is the time that all these things can be addressed. The psychosocial issues can be addressed because when a mother knows that is going to have a baby with a cleft lip and palate, the mother can be adequately prepared by counseling and she knows that oh, this is what is expected and all her concerns will be addressed. And then this is when also the feeding instructions will be given because we know that these babies born with cleft have a lot of feeding challenges because of the cleft that they have. So that this is the time the mother needs to know that this baby you are going to have, you need to have extra care, you need to make extra preparation, and then you need to plan how the baby is going to feed. So these are the activities, interventions you need to do at the prenatal age. When the baby is born to one month, this is where the baby is sent to a cleft team to assessment. The diagnosis and counseling also continues. The psychosocial issues are not really addressed. The mother and the family are counseled properly because it's a very big challenge to them. And feeding is really one of the biggest challenges that these mothers have, especially for babies who have cleft palate. These mothers have seen a baby that does not look like the normal babies they have or the babies they've seen. And they say that it has this hole, the baby cannot lie to the breast. They have this big challenge of feeding. And these are issues that need to be addressed. Because no matter the facilities and capacity you have, if this baby do not grow and try, there is nothing that can be done for them. So these feeding and psychosocial issues are addressed at this early stage of, the, of, 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 this, of these babies. And then if the baby has a, uh, a protruding premaxilla, pre-surgical orthopedics might be looked at if the capacity is available. From four to four months, we continue to monitor feeding and growth because this is indispensable. And at three months, that is when most of these clear babies are repaired, the lips are repaired. Then we monitor the ears and the hearing because most of the babies that have clear palate have problem with the esthetician teeth. And also, so the ENT is supposed to come and assess and know that, okay, things are happening. If it needs a comment, then preparation are made for this to be done. And then the pre-surgical orthopedics, if it's indicated, begins or continues so that the feeding can be a feeding plate. Five to 15 months, we see that the feeding is a key thing because we need to monitor the growth and development constantly to see because if these things are addressed properly, the growth of these babies are the same thing with, they don't have an inherent thing that makes them underweight or stunted. It's because of lack of adequate nutrition. So we need to monitor this properly as we continue our treatment. Monitor the air and hearing and we consider air tubes at this age. This is the time the cleft palate is also repaired. We look at it and see what we need to do. And then at this age also, the teeth, have, the baby teeth have started uh, started erupting. So we need to instruct the parents in oral hygiene because this is very key to the growth of these babies. At 16 to 24 months, the air also is assessed again and speech and language is also assessed and development is monitored. So you see it's a continuum of treatment so that these things and we look at the different milestones and the things that need to happen at the appropriate time. At two to five years, the speech and language is addressed. If the lip has, the palate has been repaired and it's uh, very pharyngeal competence, this also can be addressed. The ears and the hearing are also considered. If there is a, if there is a uh, poor uh, repair of the lip and nose, the revision can be done before the baby goes to school. Because when the baby goes to school, we know peer pressure and cause if the baby looks so much abnormal than the normal, school children, bullying and other things will happen. So we need to consider this before the baby goes to school. And also we need to assess development and social adjustment so that the baby will need to monitor and see that the baby is living up to adequate milestones appropriate for the age group. Six to 11 years, we are, the language is also considered, the VP is, VPI is done. The orthodontic intervention, now the teeth have erupted, I was need to see how they are growing. If those ones that are mal we need orthodontic intervention. 
And the age of nine to 11, this is the time we consider an available bone graft for these babies. And then we plan that also, assess school and social adjustment so that these babies are started going to school and we need to look at them. So we see that social, psychosocial adjustment intervention is something that is key. And this is one, a critical area we need to look at in our own environment here so that this capacity needs to be developed so that we don't just leave these babies on their own. At 12 to 21 years, this, this is when the orthodontic surgeries are done, rhinoplasty, right? if they are needed. These are times the orthodontic is continued, permanent uh, fixed orthodontics are done. If the, there is a need for bridges, implants, these ones are done. And then now you can cancel that, okay, if you want to marry, this is the possibility, these are things you need to know about the possibility of your child that you are going to have. We have clear people and palates. And then we also assess the school and psychosocial adjustment. So, in conclusion, we have an overview of the global body. Look at the epidemiology, etiology, and genetics. Talk briefly about the embryology and classification uh, of the clavier and palate. Uh, we are giving that. I hope that our clear services in West Africa that can be reorganized that the critical element of care will be the protocol we follow for all our comprehensive care services. We really need to commend the SMILE train for initiating this comprehensive care care so that we need to see how we can make it a routine. And for us to make it a routine, we need to reorganize ourselves into CLEF teams so that for sustainability and continuity of care, and for us to be able to provide this critical element of care, we need to work as teams. So instead of us working as surgeons, solo surgeons, we need to see how we can pull our resources together. And that is when we can identify the outstanding skills and capacity that are deficient so that we can develop that. And I'm advising that if we can look at this regionally, in Nigeria we have six zones. We should be looking at how we can have six zones that have comprehensive health care. So pull all the uh, uh, skills and capacities we have in these regions and see how we can identify a center where all our patients will come to, and then we can have this continuity of care that is provided. I want to appreciate the West African College of Surgeons and the African and West African Smite Regional Directors for this initiative. This is a very brilliant initiative as they're in this lockdown period, and I hope that we continue to appreciate what they are doing. And finally, I pray that Professor Court Cotton Wish chapter can be written. This is my biggest wish that we in the developing country can write and show that this is how we are doing and this is how we are done, looking at the best practices everywhere so that our own outcomes are not inferior to what they are doing, despite the challenges we have so that we can provide an indigenous solution to our own problem. I want to thank everybody for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Debola, for this extensive lecture. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, I was thanking Professor Debola for this uh, lecture. The mic will soon be unmuted for us to take a few questions and comments. I'm sure he will respond. But since I have the privilege of the mic, I just have two issues I would like to Professor Debola to respond to. The first is a little bit academic. Talking about the classification of cleft lip and cleft palate. We use cleft lip, cleft palate, cleft of the primary palate, cleft of the secondary palate. I know they are not mutually exclusive, but for academics, which one do we stick to? That's my first question. The second one, we need in our sub uh, a comprehensive protocol for cleft management. Most of us seem to focus on patients presenting early. What do we do for adult patients who come with these effects, both cleft lip and cleft palate? 
Do we combine with that? Do we stage it because they're already grown up? I want to know your take on that. Do I take all the questions or I answer the questions that they asked? You just respond to these two while others get their questions ready. But after this, oh, thank you very much. The, but the first question is on classification. As I said, there are so many classifications that we have. And it depends on the need for this classification. What you do want the need? Is it for academic purposes? Is it for computerization? Is it for just the management of what you want to do? That is what now determines the type of classification you use. That's my point. Because every classification, after a short time, you see that there is a new modification. So it depends on the need of the classification you have. But if it's just for the repair of the surgery or to also do your uh, service or repair the care you want to do, you look at what you want to do so that you pick, because there's a gamut of classifications, as I told you, that are in the literature. So it depends on what you want to do. If you want to compare the outcome of your, uh, of your, of your treatment, I want to use a classification that can give an objective measurement, then you look at what you need to use so that you are consistent in that. So that there is no one uh, this thing fix all. It depends on the need of what you want to do that you now determine the type of classification that you use. Secondly, you talk about adult, adult care patients that come. I think as I told you initially at our introduction that we, in, in, in our own setup, we have a backlog of a lot of adult cases. So once they come, the good news about these adult cases is that most of them, the facial growth is, is completed. Initially, we are thinking about what, why do we need to repair the palate for adult class that speech have already been uh, compromised. But we see from our own studies and from the repairs we've done for adult class, we see that there's a bit of improvement in their speech, despite the fact that they are, they, they are coming very late. So there is still a need for that. And these are evidences we need to develop to look at it and work with our speech pathologists to really assess this and generate evidence to show that, that you are coming late does not preclude you from having these services done for you. But the good news is that now we are not thinking about restriction of growth. The facial growth is completed. So anything you want to do, you can do it comprehensively. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. The initial plan for questions and comments was that we send them uh, by chat through your lectures. But uh, that did not take place. I can see four, four participants have raised their hands to ask their questions. I think the mic should be released to them. They will to these four questions, and I think we can wrap up there after. If four participants have their hands up, can you please have the mic to ask their questions? I can see Mohammed. Hello? Hello. Yeah. I'm hearing you. Hello. I can see Mohammed. Olubeni. Yes. Olubeni is on. Hello. Go ahead, Olubeni. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Ah, uh, then. Uh, oh, God. Like yes, sir. I would like to thank uh, Professor Adebola for this beautiful presentation. Uh. Well, uh, I've seen all the presentation is well documented and well arranged. But one thing that is missing, which uh, I know you are actually doing, is to give us some of the experience of how you manage your patients, as well as regarding nutritional rehabilitation that you have formulated yourself. I would have expected you to have brought that one up so that you can use it to educate all of us in Africa. Because that is one area we are still lacking nutritional rehabilitation of patients that are having problems before surgery. I don't know whether it can be included, maybe in, your, in, your, in answering the question, you can tell us a little bit on how to do your nutritional rehabilitation for children that have problems before surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much you. for that question. Can Mohammed uh, be given access to ask his question? Hello. Hello. Uh, very thanks for this uh, informative lecture. I have two uh, questions. Uh, 
اب ريجارد امبريولوجي انكومبليت كليفت ليب ويز انكومبليت سوفت بالات Uh, the second question you didn't mention and you didn't mention the uh, median cleft lip. Uh, is it in the classification or not? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have Osaro ask his question? Yeah. Good morning, sir. Thank you for the presentation. My question is um, regarding the present. Um, issue of financing of health care. You know, considering the fact that um, you said um, the estimated average lifetime treatment cost for cleft lip and palate patients is about, in, in the U.S., is about $101,000. So I don't know if there's a national policy or, you know, a regional policy to support, you know, um, partners of smile training. You know, apart from smile training supporting us, we want to at least use this medium to also ask if the West African College of Surgeons has a plan to integrate funding from government before we get into the pandemic where um, cleft lip and palate patients become a problem and we can't handle in the future. So it's more finance and support. Yeah, thank you. Support. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now take Moni to ask a question. Moni Ernest. Thank you very much, Professor Debola, for that um, enlightening presentation. There's an aspect that um, I expected you to bring up more because, you know, for parents, whose children have cleft lip from palate, the initial challenge is the aesthetics, you know, they are concerned about how their, how their children look. And when this is repaired, you know, most people think that that solves it. But no, by the time the children get to school and the malalignment of their teeth now becomes a very disfiguring thing that brings great psychological effects. And you find that, you know, this is the time they're now, they're now concerned about, you know, the aesthetics and the spectrum program. Thank God that now they're introducing the orthodontic aspect, but I'm advocating that it should be more prominent because this is what now disturbs both the parents and the patient in the later life by the time the teeth uh, developed. You know, the initial problem was a soft uh, tissue problem, the lips, you know, that uh, cleft and the disfigurable. But by the time these are repaired, when those teeth are coming up, by the time the children are going to school, you know, is the, is the malocclusion that is now a big challenge, the big psychological problem to them when they are being teased and bullied in school and finding mates and finding work, you know, it's a constant source of emotional stress. And I think more emphasis and more funds should be put into this orthodontic aspect if we are really going to bring out patients that are going to fit emotionally, psychologically, and have a life. So that's my contribution and what I also want us to call. Thank you very much for that. We'll take the last question from Hanu. Hanu, last question. Well, we can't get Hanu to, to ask the question. Can Professor Adebola just respond to this before we wrap up? Sorry, Thank you very much. Yeah, right. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ben, uh, you spoke about the nutrition. Why I didn't go into nutrition is that part of the uh, program that is planned, the nutrition is part of it. But I can share experience of, briefly share experience 
of how we manage our nutrition and sector. Because I think it's one of the most critical things that is missing. Because most of the centers, they see their patients and give them three months. When baby is three months, come back, and they don't know the challenges these mothers have. These mothers come, they're overwhelmed, they don't know what to do about feeding, they don't know how to feed. They have this challenge that these babies are not as the normal babies they have. The first thing that is necessary is counseling. And this counseling is very key that once these mothers are cancelled, empathize with them for you to know that they have this big challenge. And then you now show them how, what they can do within their own environment. Because you know that most of the patients who have are very, very poor. They come from very poor areas. So you need to let them know that these babies can be fed. The first thing you need to find out is that are they having enough breasts? Do they have enough breasts? What do they need to do about, this, about the breast milk? Because breast milk is advocated as the best the feed for the babies, so that we encourage them to know how to express this breast, how to position the babies, how to manage them, and to know that this baby, because of especially those who have clear palate, that they can spend a lot of energy in sucking, that the food they take will not be useful to them, so that you know that they are not doing so much work. And if there is a need for them to express, and then now give this meat to them. Because in our own center, we use the, uh, the syringe. I will say that this syringe works perfectly for us. Because the advantage of the syringe is that you are in control of the quantity you are giving. You know the amount of food you are giving to your baby. You can position the baby properly. You can now see how the baby is going. And you don't overfeed the baby. And the baby is not stressing. It's, it's, it's an effortless way of feeding these babies. And then you start managing and taking their weight. For mothers who do not have breasts, what you need to ex explain to them is for them to see how they can have supplement to use. We have the uh, 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 formula that we use. And when they're about three to six months, we have a local uh, formula that we use for them. So, so it's best and for us to address them. A lot of them don't come back to us because the mothers are overwhelmed and they know what to do and these babies die. So that, that is what we need to do. If you have, we are looking at it that in the future, we're hoping that by the time we can see changes in thoughts to that baby, it encourages them to do that. So that is about nutrition, but there is going to be a topic on nutrition. And this, and Mohammed, you are talking about the etiology of soft palate, uh, incomplete uh, soft palate and palate. Once you know the embryology, that is, I think that is what is most important. Once you know the embryology of how these things form, I know that the palate and the lip, they are two different things entirely. I know what is happening. I think that is what is most important. When you are managing this patient, it depends on the deformity they have that you address. I want to know whether they are syndromic or non-syndromic. So that is what I need to say about that. Uh, Osaro, you are talking about the financing. The financing is a very key thing. And this is where I think we need to be smart. Because we are benefiting from the benefits of smart train. With this coronavirus, with this economic meltdown, we don't know what is going to happen. We need to be smart to start reorganizing ourselves so that we can now have a platform that can have strong advocacy. And if that is going to be done, we need to have a center that does comprehensive care that we can have the number of patients, that we can have the spectrum of care we are providing, and then we can now assess the national platforms that are there. When you look at the NHIS, you see that there is a NHIS free service for children in Nigeria. But if we are not organized, there is no way we'll be able to do this. So what I, need, I think we need to do now is to see how we can organize ourselves, pull our resources together. Industries are doing that. Pull your resources together and become bigger. Instead of us wanting to do solo services everywhere we are, we need to pull our resources together so that we can improve the quality of care we give and they cannot have a very strong platform to now advocate with the Ministry of Health and also with any other international partner that want to support us. But I think this is something we need to do to be smart about this thing. Because I'm telling you after coronavirus, the world will not be easy. We are going to a new normal. So we need to be proactive in what we are doing and we need to look at that and see that the financial aspect is addressed so that we can now do a comprehensive care, we can do a thorough costing so that when we are making advocacy, we can know how much to ask for from the 
from this uh, from these uh, uh, institutions. Uh, money earners, uh, you are talking about uh, the psychosocial experts and the estate. I mentioned it, and I said that's why we should not think that CLEX care is just about the surgery alone. It's a comprehensive thing. It's not only about orthodontists, it's also about speech, it's about hearing, it's about development. So these are things we really need to look at. And instead we have teams, we will not be able to do these things. Because if you are not a doctor and you are working alone, for us to, uh, to refer a patient to you is difficult. But if you are working as a team and we are gathered together, we cannot look at this patient holistically. And the parents can be properly counseled that it's not only this sleep that you are going to do, there are other things that your baby needs and we need to address them. And the timing for all these things will be done. So these are things we need to be doing so that we ourselves will be happy that we are doing a comprehensive care. We need to leverage on this uh, benevolence of smile train for us to have the maximum benefit of the dollar they are giving us. So that we look at it and say, how do we be smart about this thing? And the way we need to be smart is for us to reorganize ourselves, for us to know that the care for cleft is not just about cost, it's not just about the aesthetics. It's a holistic treatment from childhood to adulthood. So, and the psychological problem must be addressed also. And all that problems that needs to be addressed should be addressed. I think these are the questions that are asked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We want to thank Professor Adito Kumba Bebola, um, consultant oral and multifacial surgeon from the Amino Clinic in Australia. For this introduction, this is the introductory lecture. For those that have more questions, I'm saying as the series continues, we're going to depth to address all these issues. Tomorrow we're logging at the same time. I believe the people problems are over. Our uh, talk tomorrow will be more spiritual approach to cleft care. We we'll look forward to such a rewarding uh, talk too. We also thank the participants for their time and also smile King and the West African Club of Surgeons for anchoring this. Thank you all. Thank you very much, SJ. And thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, everyone, and see you tomorrow, same time. Thank you.